Thank you very much for the invitation to the organizers. Pleasure to be here. Um, what I wanted to talk about is something uh, more um, conceptual, more normative around the, the issues that are central to uh, this meeting. Sometimes I can't see it on my thing here, but that's okay. So, some years ago I wrote a book actually on populism and communication uh, from Latin America, a book in 2013 in, in, in Spanish, and I never thought that I was going to be talking about something related to these issues theoretically to an audience primarily of US and European researchers. So let me just give you the uh, headline here. What uh, the argument I, I want to present is the following, that the, the current chaos of public communication um, raises challenges for democracy, which I believe these challenges are captured by the concept of post-truth politics. I will explain in a few minutes what this big concept post-truth population public communication referred to. And the argument is that there is an affinity between post-truth and populism. And uh, as a result of this, what I think, this will be my, my, my last point, is that what this signals is the crisis of foundational models of democratic communication, which I think should lead, uh, seems to me, to the kind of discussion that we want to have here about interrogating the feasibility of the premises of the typical models that underpin much of the work in political communication and journalism studies. So but about the, by the case of public communication, I'm referring to these issues mentioned here, which the literature of both journalism studies and political communication has explored uh, extensively in the past <coughs> decade. Collapse of multi-layer news gatekeeping, new forms of gatekeeping, the, the um, intermediation of communication, new forms of mediation, the fractured communication commons and the proliferation of media spheres, and high choice media ecology in public communication. I won't go into that right now because of time. So, um, to me, what this raises, this sort of uh, fragmentation, this fracturing of public communication, is the notion that no single regime of truth uh, actually exists, if it ever existed in previous times. And um, by re regime of truth, what I, re what I mean is the accepted rules and established practices that define public knowledge and regulate discourse. What is a fact, what is knowledge, right. um, And it seems to me that what we see now is sort of the challenges to the principles of the scientific model and the feasibility of value-neutral mechanisms to produce uncontestable facts to document reality. Of course, these premises have been central to modern let's say, part of 20th century journalism in this country and, and elsewhere. So what do we mean by closed truth communicative politics? Uh, it's not the absence of truth, but actually the relativism of facts and truth, and uh, the situation of fragmented, fractured truth. This is shown in the mainstreaming of factless conviction, uh, convictions relatively impervious to corrections. I know the literature on fact-checking and corrections is ambivalent on this. There is evidence showing that, yes, some kind of factual uh, corrections are possible. Some of the literature says that is, that is not necessarily the case. Um, plus, on top of this, another layer is constant disinformation by mirror institutions and, and groups. And what it means, in, in, in my mind, this uh, represents is that truth-telling and recent communication as a common public project is uncertain, if not forever, uh, compromised. Uh, I'm not wedded to the notion of post-truth communicative politics yet. I, I mean, I know that labels bring citations and all that stuff, but it's something that in some ways captures sort of some of the dynamics we're talking about here. Where do we see this? And there is a growing literature actually showing this, the symptoms of what I just described, the pockets of uh, misinformation, forms of knowledge that flatly <coughs> negate scientific and technical facts of truth and truth. This is demonstrated in different forms of historical denialism. The pockets that reject scientific conclusions on a variety of, of areas, the environment, immunization, infectious diseases, uh, healthcare, as well as the persistent uh, incorrect views about policies and impact, the stance that a politician takes or the impact of several uh, public policies on issues such as tax taxes, budget, immigration, public safety. Uh, back in 2015, Journal of Communication, which 
I started editing, the first issue was devoted to <coughs> the question of misinformation in my mind because I was convinced that this is one sort of central question that crosses several areas of specialization in communication studies. Um, another symptom of this is <coughs> the fractured trust in the news media. This is information data from the Pew Research Center about the United States. But equally interesting is that it's not just fractured trust, but um, partisan trust. That, that trust in the media, that partisanship is a strong predictor of um, attitude about the news media. A more recent study by a pointer, the Media Trust Survey, actually comes up with a very similar um, conclusion. Um, another symptom of what I'm describing is disinformation, news exposure, and sharing. And this is a question that is central to the current debate about so-called fake news. And in my mind, what that shows, or what, what that reinforces, the existence of different contracts between news producers and readers. The truth is not something intrinsic to the news or the ideas, but the news are pragmatically constructed, to paraphrase William James, truth is what happens to news, rather than what is something intrinsic to news, and is grounded in historical situation and identity. Um, the next issue here is that post-truth communication is anchored in the presence of simultaneous dynamics and forces, in the alliance of corporate money, legacy of online media unconstrained by the conventional professional ideas of journalism, social media and personal networks, elite cues, indexing, and mobilization, and tap into this deep-seated non-factual belief and is articulated in everyday identity politics. What this results is in a toxic combination of the blurring of fact and fiction, something that mid-century critics of mass society and totalitarianism, like Kai Arendt and Fedor uh, Adorno, actually describe, right? The, the blurring of fact and, and fiction. Um, so that's one half of what I'm trying to say. Um, so the question is, what kind of communicative politics, what kind of public communication is possible in this condition? Enter populism. Um, to me, the global absence of populist politics is symptomatic of the consolidation of the post-truth communication that I just quickly described. Uh, because the kind of post-truth politics represented by populism thrives in the current conditions of public communication. Uh, my argument in a huge discussion about what populism is, but in some ways related to communication issues, populism's binary Schmittian conception of, of politics is opposed to the possibility of truth telling as a collective effort to produce agreed upon fact, which is a central notion in much of philosophical liberalism, and to reach basic consensus on the correspondence between assertions and reality. I don't have to tell this crowd sort of we're in the middle of a populist moment, particularly on both sides of the North Atlantic. And we already heard this morning, a few minutes ago, about the semantic ambiguity of populism. Uh, we'll never settle this point, just to do an announcement. I think Mueller's book does a very good book in serving the ambiguity, and this is something that for a variety of reasons, uh, this question about what it is will not be settled. In all discussion, I'm not just trying to cope out of this, but in two provided a way to avoid discussion. What I think, what is central for the questions that many of us have in this room, is populism illiberalism. Because populism fundamentally is in opposition to bedrock principles of democratic communication, such as freedom of speech, freedom of the press, the right to communication, fact-based and recent public debate, public criticism, informed citizenship, tolerance, and empathy. And the examples that we have from the non-Western world, from the <coughs> place that I know better, Latin America, actually suggest this. And in some ways, we can sort of uh, come up with sort of an inductive model of populist communication from a variety of case studies that actually show these being some common, common issues on right-wing and left-wing populism, or different kinds of populism, or reactionary or progressive uh, populism. Um, and populist 
populist illiberalism is grounded in its agonistic view of politics, something that has been extensively discussed <coughs> by um, Arditi in, in, in this book came out a few years ago, that, um, that populism basically always walks on the edge of liberalism. It has a very conflicted sort of relationship with basic principles of liberal democracy. Um, populism basically advances an agonistic view of politics and public communication. What does it mean? Basically, it comes down not just to this sort of eventual bi binary position of, of, of conceptualization of politics, but the idea that politics is always about conflict. <coughs> it basically takes adversarialism of politics to an extreme. Um, and this is represented in the way that populism sort of rejects central principles of liberal communication. Uh, the disdain for dissident journalism and critical public expression. And this is some of the sort of behaviors identified with populists, not only in, in, in Latin America, also in Eastern Europe, and in other parts of the, of, of the world, that actually demonstrate, put in, in evidence, this sort of flat rejection of critical principles of what eventually came uh, to be identified <coughs> with um, public communication in liberal democracy. Preference for friendly press conference, aggressive relation with critical news organizations, support of digital harassment networks of trolls, constant attacks on reporters, intellectuals, and government organizations, and, and science, legal persecution and undoing of legal support for the scrutiny <coughs> of power, and disabled constitutional mechanisms that could claim the power of the head of government and change the rules of democratic gain. So here what we have in populism is the dismissal of fact-based truth-pursuing communication. Uh, and I'm not romanticizing the search for the truth. My premise here is that the search for the truth is central to democratic communication, even as elusive and difficult as it is. But instead, populism embraces the notion that truths are necessarily partial, that truth does not exist as a collective common goal, because truth is divided and anchored in particular social interests. Those interests vary according to what is the left wing or right wing interpretation of politics. The nation, so different ways in which us versus them gets crystallized. And therefore, truth seeking is not a collective common project, but rather it's about reaffirming certain so-called popular truths against elite lies. And I put that in quotes because what those two concepts mean varies uh, tremendously. So the pop in, for populism, the search for the truth basically de demands the, the denunciation of the false beliefs propagated by the array of institutions that are seen part of what would the ruling bloc or the elite and the cultivation and expression of popular views if you are distorted by ruling um, powers. So, no wonder that basically what populism does, populism jettisons the entire edifice of liberal democratic truth-telling, whether the more traditional idea of uh, liberal notion of the marketplace represented in the, in, in the, in the necessity for autonomous, mutual, dispassionate thought for these institutions, or the more deliberatory approach to uh, democratic communication, grounded on communitarian dialogue and intersubjective understanding. So, because he conceives politics as pure agonism, politics has, uh, populism has no use for the communicative commons. The idea of the communicative commons is opposed to a purely belligerent, conflict-centered view of, of politics. Who needs recent deliberation or check on power if politics about conflict and decisionism by the leader. So, I'm <coughs> here by the communication commons, and I assume in different interpretations, the kind of space that facilitates informed deliberation, civility, diversity, tolerance, solidarity, mission, and facts, right? That came sort of crystallized in different concepts of marketplace of ideas, the deal the public sphere. Um, the absence of this and populism in opposition to this means that populism festers in the absence of the communication commons. The, absence of the collapse of the communication commons actually fits populism's ontological view of what politics and communication are about. And furthermore, 
offers a deep and worrisome trends in contemporary politics, intolerance, aversion to recent debate, misinformation, and weak accountability. <coughs> and to conclude, so, so what do we do, given, given this? I, I don't think that populism and post-truth politics should be simply criticized, which we should. But in some ways, I think it's an opportunity to uh, examine closely the viability of the democratic model and principles that underpin much of the analysis in our field. So the question is, or one of the questions is, in populist times, how are communicative politics that promote tolerance and engagement with others, fact-based truth-telling, critical rationality, and solidarity possible beyond limited cases? Or for that matter, can any normative vision of public communication be possible at a time of fractured public communication, in time of the absence of the communication comes. Another reason why we need to interrogate our, the premises of our, of our work is to interrogate the visibility of democratic communication ideals in light of strong real world pockets of prejudice and hatred, social fragmentation, and high choice communication. So that's on the one hand, right? How do we, how the kind of politics that underpin our normative models are viable given these conditions? But at the same time, the current rise of the politics of adversarialism, contestation and imposition, I mean the critique of populism and neoliberalism promotes the kind of politics that is not really about consensus seeking, it's about critique, contestation, hold power responsible. So the politics of contention title of this meeting, is how do we reconcile at a time we have populism that embraces the politics of contestation and the critique of, poli of populism also embraces the politics of contestation, how normative ideas about consensus seeking, truth as a common project, are possible when resisting populism and resisting neoliberalism are central to the alternative of the problem that we are diagnosing here. When collective action looks like this, then how do we think about truth as a common project? Should we continue thinking about it in that, in that way? Uh, so I want to leave you with four questions. I think that's expected. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you step down. <laughs> so first question is how the model of communication commons possible? What kind of communicative politics are possible amid information chaos and the network public sphere? Right. Are we upholding an ideal that if it was very difficult, almost impossible back in the day, how feasible, how viable it is, even if we agree with its normative premises? Second, where are virtuous practices? Can they be replicated and scale up? We see a number of examples of consensus building and deliberative politics in our societies. Many of you are experts and we're written about this. The question is whether or not they can be replicated, they can be scaled up. Third, why the failure, or if you want to be more optimistic, the limited success to shape policies following ideas of democratic communication. We're busy sort of extolling the virtues of the model that seemingly crashed down a few years ago with the rise of the upsurge of focus. So what do we do with that? How do we interrogate the premises of the work which many of us actually continue to uphold as necessary for a democratic order. This leads me to the fourth and final question, which is, should the model of informed, reasoned, deliberative communication be revisited and or transcendent? Um, I'm not sure which, one, which way I will go, but to me that is sort of an important question to revisit exactly what, what, what it is. Remember the match of the notion of the marketplace of ideas, as well as the notion of the public sphere, is premised, and I will conclude on this, on the capacity to change minds. What are we talking about John Stuart Mill, John Rawls, Hubert Habermas? There's a notion that that encounter with other opinions assumes the capacity to change minds. And John Rawls said it, that you cannot have liberal democracy without some of these conditions. And it seems to me that this is part of the challenge that we are seeing now that in some ways I crystallized in what we call broadly defined focus. Thank you very much. <laughs>